good evening to all of you uh, good evening kamal uh, can you hear me yes yes good evening <laughs> uh, yeah uh, very nice to uh, hear from you and uh, thank you very much so uh, nice to see you all uh, i think uh, they will join uh, kamal as we also uh, so uh, once again good evening everyone let me introduce dr kamal valgamma to you uh, so dr kamal valgamma currently working at uh, general hospital uh, uh, this is in, uh, this provincial hospital badul uh, as a consultant psychiatrist uh, so he is he is one of our uh, again a very uh, uh, one of the very prolific alumni from uh, peradenia who was actually my batchmate from 97 98 batch uh, and we have a very long history also so kamal was my classmate and we were in the same uh, class and same row so then uh, in the same uh, batch and actually uh, we were roommates as well so we have a very long history so it's very i am very pleased to introduce uh, dr kamal valgamma to you uh, so i am sure that uh, uh, so kamal is going to talk about a very com common topic in psychiatry and uh, he will be discussing some uh, questions also so i am very i am very much sure now all the students can uh, enjoy his lecture as well as uh, learn quite a lot about uh, the the psychiatric manifestations and some examples also so without taking much of his time uh, once again i am very happy to introduce you kamal and thank you very much for accepting uh to uh, come and talk at this uh, you know you this off hours uh so over to you kamal thank you very much thank you very much and uh, good evening to you all um i'm sure uh, can you all hear me can uh, the mind i think they can hear me right can you all hear me all right yes. so yeah so first of all um, uh, let me uh, thank uh, dr dumide saran um, for uh, inviting me to conduct this discussion and also dr sairi perera uh, both of them are uh, my very good friends and uh, i'm very happy to actually get involved with pems activities uh, and this actually brings back uh, uh, good memories about pera denia um, as um, uh, dumide I explained we were batchmates and we really enjoyed pemsa lectures those days so so, uh, so the difference uh, um, um, is that uh, we can enjoy learning in a very relaxed um, environment because uh, nobody is trying to sort of um, um, push you or scrutinize you so you can really uh, relax and enjoy and also i, I think uh, you can um, Uh, raise questions. You can ask anything. Um, I'm not one of your regular examiners, so you don't have to worry about you know remembering your faces or anything like that. You can just ask questions and get involved. That's very important. I think um, uh, we also should develop the skill of you know um, getting involved and you know raise your voice whenever you want. So, um, so, um, so shall we start the? Um, case discussion um i share my confirm whether you can see the presentation Yes. Yes. Can you? All right. So, as uh, Dr. Dumindi Asran explained, uh, we are going to talk about a very common scenario, common clinical scenario, um, patient with confusion. Um, so, this is very common, and as doctors, you will. see these patients on a regular basis i'm sure as medical students also you would have seen patients who are confused um but what is meant by confusion can anybody uh, explain what is 
what is the definition of confusion i'm sure you all know what is confusion is but you know what is the medical definition you can tell anything you don't have to worry about whether you are giving a dumb answer or not um we are here to learn anybody sit okay without um, putting you in all in trouble i'll i proceed you, you know confusion is a common word we use in day to day clinical practice um technical um, medical term it's actually a lay term but we commonly use this because we are all are confused about confusion um uh, that's why i selected this topic um we commonly um um uh, describe a patient as having confusion but that is not enough it's a very lay way, lay um way of you know explaining um a patient's condition uh, so we'll discuss about the case first then we'll um and try to understand how to um diagnose these patients and what is the actual medical diagnosis we can make and how to manage these patients and things like that um okay so um so this is the case okay so we have a 62 year old male admitted um, uh, to the surgical ward four days back with right leg swelling and he has been diagnosed as having um uh, cellulitis and he's on treatment for cellulitis but since about two days back he has developed confusion has become agitated and then there's general deterioration of his physical health um so can how how should we proceed so imagine you are a intern medical officer in the surgical ward and you are one of um, the nurses would come and tell you um doctor me patient da satrakata kalin awa hondata awa den tika confused wage amutu katha kiyena i'm sorry about uh, the language you know um, uh, the, i'm sorry uh, the, um, uh, that i use singhalese but this is the way they usually they uh, present so a nursing officer would come and tell you that the patient was admitted with sound mind but now the patient is confused and talking irrelevant things and agitated and the patient is fine but now patient has started you know uh, behaving in an abnormal way uh, sometimes of course patients may come with confusion on admission the patient is confused um uh, but sometimes commonly actually patients become confused after admitting to the medical ward after a few days uh, sometimes um right so what now how should we proceed can anybody uh, um explain me how to proceed what are you going to do so you are doctor and um, the nursing officer is um, uh, so, so she is worried that the patient is deteriorating and is confused so what are you going to do anybody assess the severity of the confusion we can look into the uh, orientation of the patient to the place uh, yeah okay very good so thank you for that and um, so she um, uh, introduced a new word orientation so that's very good we'll 
know how to assess the severity of confusion. How should we assess the severity of confusion? Okay, that's a good answer. Um, but um, of course, is this um, history enough for you to come to a conclusion? What test do you want to know? Her answer is very correct. That's a very important thing. So we should look for um, orientation. That's one of the bases we have to um, assess for in these patients. We have to. Yep. Yes. We have to. Exclude medical condition like sepsis. Okay, very good. You have to exclude sepsis. How, how are you going to exclude sepsis? So how, how, how are you going to diagnose whether the patient is having sepsis? Looking to physical parameters like uh, whether the patient have uh, tachypnea and blood pressure. Okay, good. So you, um, all right. So this is uh, a very broad picture, right? So we there are a lot of possibilities that that can be there in this patient. So how how should we narrow down? Okay, imagine this is written essay question. So how are you going to um, um, organize your answer? Because this is very important. How 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 you should. Sir, so we need to uh, attend quickly to the patient. Okay. And uh, why, 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 why? If um, possible, we can. Yeah. So why, why do you want yeah, to so attend to the to patient be... quickly? Uh, because uh, he has confusion, yes. uh, it may be, uh, and also he has a history of uh, cellulitis, mm -hmm. so he may be in uh, septic shock. Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, so we need to uh, take a history uh, from patient, or if possible, from uh, collateral information. Yeah, very good. Yes. Uh, then uh, we need to examine uh, mainly uh, vital signs like blood brain output. Yeah, uh, okay. And then uh, we need to take uh, samples for investigations like serum electrolyte, uh, for, uh, blood, uh, blood glucose. Uh, mm -hmm. ABG, serum creatinine, mm -hmm. uh, like uh, investigations. Yeah, very good. Anything else? Uh, uh, with these things, uh, uh, we may be able to come to a diagnosis. Okay. Okay, very good. Um, so basically, we have to now um, look at this clinical scenario in two different angles. One is now we have an emergency. So is confusion an emergency? What do you think? Is it a medical emergency or a psychiatric emergency? You very correctly said that we have to attend to the patient quickly. So we have on. Uh, so we have to um, attend to the patient quickly because it's an emergency. I, I'll tell you now. This is an emergency, and at the same time, you have to assist the patient to come to a clinical diagnosis. And so you have to do these things in advance. 
Okay, so um, so you have to do a thorough examination. You have to take a good history and you know get the information as much as possible and as quickly as possible. And um, um, so you have to come to a diagnosis. And at the same time, you have to manage the patient without sort of. So why is this an emergency? So it, it could do you agree that this is an emergency? Sorry. Delirium is a psychiatric emergency, sir. Okay, yeah, okay. It's um, um, not only a psychiatric emergency, it's an, it's an emergency, a medical emergency. It has, you know, psychiatric component also, but it has a very important medical component too. Okay, so I agree, it's an emergency. So why is it an emergency? The patient's condition is acutely progressing and it involves the global impairment of the uh, multiple higher functions of the brain. Yeah. Now, confusion is actually what, what it means is that patient is in somewhat um, decompensated state. Uh, patient is, patient's cognitive reserve is struggling due to some insult, okay? So unless proven otherwise, it's an emergency. So we have to um, attend to this and um, uh, try to recover the patient as soon as possible, okay? So very good, I'm, I'm very happy that you gave um, good answers, but you know, at the same time, try to organize your answer. That is very important. So you have to, as I, I told you, you have to quickly make a good assessment. So the assessment will include uh, a history, history. So sometimes there may be a person uh, whom you can talk to, there may be a bystander, but you can talk to the nurse and you know, that history is also very important, you know? And also you can go through the clinic records, um, and um, um, drug history and see what is happening. And, um, and you have to quickly do a, do a thorough examination and see what is happening and try to come to a clinical diagnosis. So confusion is not a clinical diagnosis. So there is usually a medical problem. So we have to identify that medical problem using your clinical skills. So you may have to do a thorough assessment and then you have to do investigations, right? How to treat as quickly as possible as one of you very clearly correctly mentioned, if the patient is septic, you have to, uh, you know, attend to that and, you know, uh, do what is necessary. Okay, so is this clear? So, um, delirium uh, is, should be delirium. So confusion is not a diagnosis. Delirium is a diagnosis, but delirium has um, two components, medical problem and the psychiatric condition or psycho, um, um, psychiatric component. So delirium is actually a syndrome. Um, so we use the term delirium to describe um, certain psychomotor changes in a patient. But there's of course another integral component of delirium, that is the medical diagnosis. So we have to say that this patient is delirious due to this medical problem, okay? So delirium is, delirium is an acute um, psychiatric or psychomotor syndrome arising due to a medical cause, okay? Do you have any questions so far? Is it clear? Is this clear? So you have to use your skills to come to a diagnosis. It can be now in this particular patient, 
the patient has presented with right leg cellulitis and the patient's general condition has been deteriorating. So as uh, one of you mentioned, one of the diagnoses is sepsis. So you will have a whole list of differential diagnoses with this bit of information, right? This can be sepsis, this can be acute renal failure, this can be, um, uh, this can be a, com a completely unrelated problem like uh, intracranial hemorrhage or, um, you know, there can be many possibilities. So at the beginning, so uh, with the short history I gave you, you can have a whole list of differential diagnosis. Of course, um, sepsis and, uh, you know, stuff like that will come at the top. But um, um, so you have to narrow down this differential diagnosis and you have to exclude certain things. So for that, you have to do a thorough assessment and um, come to a medical diagnosis or set of differential or workable differential diagnosis, right? So that part is clear. So you have to come to a, um, you have to, uh, diagnose this patient as having uh, some kind of medical problem. But now there's this other component called delirium. So how should you diagnose delirium? So confusion, so you should not use the term confusion, the diagnosis. So confusion is not a diagnosis. Delirium is a diagnosis. Uh, we'll discuss about it. So we'll try to understand this clinical scenario. Then I will actually um, give you few, you know, I present a few slides on theoretical aspect and you will understand this um, more. So how should you diagnose delirium? Anybody? Okay, so we'll proceed and see. Now this patient, uh, you, um, go through the bed head ticket and you um, uh, identify that the patient has been having diabetes mellitus and also a non-patient with hypertension. Past psychiatric history, patient was treated for depression about 20 years back, but now not on any medications. So this is all you know at the moment, you cannot find a bystander, you just go through the uh, bed head ticket and then, um, So now you have some more information. And then this is the social history. So it used with the by Nokia others, independent around the house before the admission. So they had been enjoying doing crosswords in recent falls that has been documented in the bed head ticket. Okay. So now um, so I'm, uh, still, there can be a long list of differential diagnoses. Talk in detail about how to diagnose the underlying medical problem, but I think you can understand that we have to take a quick history, do a thorough examination, do investigations. And depending on your initial assessment, you order investigations, first line investigations and second line investigations and you try to come to a provisional working diagnosis. At the same time, you try to stabilize the patient. You, uh, um, if the patient is dehydrated, you have to hydrate the patient. If the patient is septic, you have to follow the septic um, protocol. If the patient is having a cardiac, um, you know, they have a cardiac issue, you have to attend to that accordingly. Um, if the patient has um, hypoglycemia, that can also cause delirium. Uh, you can get into that. Sometimes delivery can be multifactorial. This patient may be having a bit of sepsis, a bit of um, uh, poor glycemic control. And so, so I'm not going to talk about that, but you can understand that we have to come to a definitive medical uh, diagnosis and we have to attend to that as quickly as possible. Okay. Now, so as a psychiatrist, so I'm 
going to um, explain you how to diagnose delirium, right? So um, can anybody tell me how to diagnose delirium? How, how can we say that this patient has delirium? So we, are not, so we are not going to use the term confusion. You can easily say that the patient is confused by just looking at the patient. But to diagnose delirium, you have to do certain um, assessments. Anybody? Using the ICD-10 criteria. Yes, very good. Okay, very good. What is what is the ICD-10 criteria? Impairment of consciousness and uh, attention, and the uh, uh, impairment of cognition, and the psychomotor disturbance, and the any emotional disturbance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very good. Anything else? If you have Dr. Google, you can search and tell me. You, know, you have that freedom also in this discussion. How should we diagnose? So the, very good. Your answer is um, um, you know, partially correct. Because you, you told me that the, you, um, we have to look for um, uh, impaired level of consciousness, okay? And in attention, memory, um, what else? Okay, I, I, so now um, I'll tell, now remember this bit. One of the easiest things you have, you can do is Check for orientation. So orientation in time, place, and person. If it is impaired, it's likely that this patient has delirium. So orientation is, ch checking orientation is part of an assessment of consciousness. So disorientation is the first step of lowering consciousness. Consciousness is actually the ability to be aware of the self. And so impairment of consciousness is very important to diagnose delirium. So these patients will have initially a slight lowering of consciousness that you can detect by testing for orientation. So you test, I am sure you all know, I'm not going to explain how to, it's very basic. So you test for time, place and person. So disorientation to time is the first, um, first sign of lowering of consciousness. The patient may be, aware of place and person, but the time will, that's the first sign. So you can actually diagnose delirium early if you are competent. That will really help the patient because delirium, as you can understand, delirium is due to the effect on the brain due to the medical condition. So if the patient is decompensating the brain or the cognitive reserve or we say um, uh, cerebral reserve cannot cope up with this. So the patient will show signs of delirium that indicates that there's something bad happening. Thank you. Uh, can you all hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, now, um, so this is, um, so these are the blood results. As you can see, uh, WPC is high slightly, um, but uh, CRP is also marginally high. So 
based on these investigations, you have to then decide what else should you do to come to definitive diagnosis. It can be sepsis or um, can be um, uh, some other thing. Okay, now, so diagnosis, so we have to uh, diagnose the patient as 70 lithium. So we describe one aspect that is the orientation. So remember this orientation. So you can easily check for orientation, but remember if the patient's consciousness is severely impaired, you may not be able to um, check for orientation. So as I told you, orientation is the first step, but if the patient has progressed, patient may even become, you, you may find that the patient is stuporous. So the uh, patient uh, uh, may not respond to your commands or may not show any reaction to external stimuli. So stupor, so, so the patient may, uh, the, the, so the consciousness will, um, the, the disorientation is the first step then the patient will gradually deteriorate up to a stupor and then the patient will die. So this is the natural progression of delirium. So patient will die. So this carries, delirium carries a very high rate of mortality, which I will explain later. That's why it is, an, it is, an, it is a medical emergency. Uh, so you have to, especially, if the patient is young and healthy, and if the patient is disoriented, that means that the patient has something serious happening. But of course, in an elderly person, delirium can arise in the context of a trivial problem, like for example, constipation or skin sepsis or um, a slight change of blood sugar. So it depends on one's cerebral capacity or cognitive reserve. And if the, if the patient has a reasonably good cognitive reserve or cerebral reserve, or in other words, if the patient has good gray matter, good, you know, a substantial amount of gray matter. So the, um, the, the severity of insult that is required to develop delirium is high. But if the patient has um, uh, reduced cognitive reserves and their cognitive reserve or cerebral capacities in the low, so those patients, delirium can arise even with trivial medical problems like urinary tract infection, mild pneumonia, uh, stuff like that. But still, this is an emergency because you, unless you very accurately diagnose and exclude all the major problems, you cannot just, you know, palm off by saying that the patient has mild problem, he's elderly. So that's why he has become delirious. You cannot do that. You have to um, try and diagnose major issues and uh, attend to them accordingly. Okay, is it clear? Now, uh, do you have any questions? Can you all hear me? Is this message, I don't know what has happened. Can you all see me and hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, any questions so far? No, I'm sorry, there's this message, I don't know why it is popping up, that's all right. Okay. So we uh, spoke about uh, disorientation to diagnose delirium. There are other features such as reversal of sleep-wake cycle. This is very important. The nurse may come, I will we'll, um, take the patient I have um, explained. Now the, pay, the nurse would say that the patient has become, deteriorated, become agitated and confused. So in the morning you go and talk to the patient, you see that the patient is all right, except some drowsiness. 
So sometimes you may become angry with the nurse, but why are you worried about this patient? But then the nurse say, nurse will say, doctor, this patient is all right now, but last night he was so confused, he was agitated and he didn't sleep. So this is called reversal of sleep-wake cycle. So they sometimes they may appear quite calm during daytime, but in the night they can become agitated. They have uh, insomnia. Um, they are very disoriented. Sometimes this um, level of orientation will improve during daytime. So there is sleep wake cycle or reversal of sleep wake cycle that is in fact due to uh, the effects on reticular formation, which is the main, which is one of the main areas. Uh, regulating our consciousness, reticular formation. And so disorientation, reversal of sleep wake cycle. And then I also, also explained uh, that these symptoms may fluctuate. The patient may become agitated at one point of time and then the patient would feel very calm at other times, especially during daytime, the patient may, quite, may be quite calm, but in the night, the patient can become very confused fluctuation of symptoms or confusion. Um, and the patient can be agitated in this particular case. Now the patient can be agitated um, and, um, but sometimes patient can be hypoactive. The patient may lie still. This is called hypoactive delirium. If the patient is agitated, we call that hyperactive delirium, which is the commoner form. But sometimes we see patients who are very calm, but disoriented, very hyperactive, uh, confused, but not very apparently um, at in diagnosing uh, delirium. Um, so remember there are two, um, uh, to, uh, so it's a spectrum, there are, there are two uh, extremes. One is hypoactive delirium, one is hyperactive delirium. So um, another feature is inattention. So they will find it very difficult to focus. So they cannot, when, when you talk to the patient, the, you may un, uh, see that the patient is very distractible. The patient cannot sort of keep focus and may tend to, uh, you know, pay attention to various other things happening around. So that's inattention. And then another very important thing, visual hallucinations and illusions. They may get a lot of um, abnormal visual perceptions. I'll give you an example. When I, I, you know, soon after finishing my internship, I worked at um, the ICU. Peradini Hospital, and then I can remember this patient who uh, ex who uh, told me that there are snakes crawling on the wall, and there are snakes on the ceiling. And then um, when I looked at the ceiling, there are these uh, lines, and he's misinterpreting these lines as snakes. So he's quite agitated. He's worried that there are snakes around. And um, so these are called illusions. So he, the patient is misinterpreting normal sensory stimuli in, a, in an abnormal way. So this can be one of the reasons for the agitation. So when a nurse uh, goes towards the patient, the patient may misinterpret uh, that the nurse is a, you know, a person who would come to harm him. Or, um, so the patient can be agitated. So these are uh, visual misinterpretations or illusions. Sometimes without any stimuli, patient can be, can get this, uh, can, uh, they, they may see uh, certain creatures, people around. So these are visual. So visual hallucinations and illusions are common compared to other conditions. Again, remember, if a patient has visual hallucinations, you have to be worried. Visual hallucinations are rare in patients with functional psychiatric happening in the brain or in the body. So 
visual hallucinations can be seen in delirium and also in certain intracranial problems like intracranial hemorrhages, you know, tumors. So um, don't uh, sort of neglect visual hallucinations. Uh, always um, be vigilant that they, if the patient has visual hallucinations, you have to you have to investigate. Uh, if this patient uh, has visual hallucinations, of course, you have to proceed with the CT scan brain. Um, and in delirium, of course, um, the threshold for CT scan brain is low. Um, uh, you know, sometimes there can be um, intracranial hemorrhages, encephalitis, meningitis, and stuff like that. So, in, so this neuroimaging is important. Sometimes EEG is necessary. Um, sometimes MRI is necessary because CTs are not going to go into details. CT scan brain will show only certain parts of the brain. So deeper areas, um, uh, you cannot actually find any abnormality in CT uh, brain. So you have to do MRI scan. Depending on your, uh, your um, clinical assessment, especially if the patient has focal neurological science, you have to do um, uh, CT scan brain. Okay. So, um, so other features. So retrospectively, you can diagnose that the patient has had a delirium if the patient recovers quickly. Because delirium is a transient syndrome. If we, um, if we sort of uh, do the correct thing patients will recover. So it's a transient thing compared to dementia. Have you heard this term dementia? Dementia is an insidious progressive condition. And sometimes in severe dementia, patient may appear confused, but then they will not recover this to remember about that. So you have to diagnose delirium using that and diagnose underlying medical problem, right? So sometimes I have seen uh, in medical uh, wards, uh, especially uh, non-psychiatric wards, whatever you have, that's not a good practice. If the patient is, you have to see why the patient is agitated. So if the patient is well oriented and has these various psychotic symptoms, it's unlikely to be delirium. It's due to uh, psychotic condition. And um, so these features that I have explained would help you to differentiate delirium from other causes of agitated behavior, okay? not as so they have memory problem or get disorientation. So in dementia, disorientation is not a feature. Their consciousness is preserved. So they are aware of their surroundings, right? Um, and also, as I explained, dementia is a progressive um, illness, insidious cause, but a delirium is an acute illness. It acute condition, it is transient. Um, sleep wake disturbances can be there in dementia, so it's not a uh, very is more in delirium. Okay, um, okay, so we'll quickly now. Um, any questions so far? So shall we quickly go through this slide? I don't know how to get rid of this message. Let's see.
Okay, sorry about this. Can you all, uh, see the slides? Hello? Yes. Can you see? Yeah, okay. Right, so, okay. Now we'll quickly go through certain theoretical aspects of delirium so that you will understand this clearer. And then we'll do some MCQs and I will uh, give some more time to ask questions. So it's a transient global disorder of cognition. So it's a transient of a person. So cognitive functions are higher order brain functions such as memory, attention, language, um, then your social behavior, um, and there are other components that you can read about. So there's global, global um, impairment along with impairment of consciousness. So compared to dementia, in dementia also there's global impairment of uh, cognitive functions, but consciousness is preserved. As I explained, it's a medical emergency and it affects about 20 to 30 percent uh, of patients that you see in general medical wards. And it's increased, it's associated with increased uh, mortality, right? So it's now. Now we described uh, this patient and uh, as you can see, it's an acute condition. So the onset is acute, sudden over hours to days, and there's decline in attention, perception and cognition, and there's fluctuating time course. It's characterized by, as I earlier mentioned, disorientation in time, place, person, impairment of concentration and attention, altered cognitive state, including memory issues, impaired ability to communicate because language is a cognitive issue, reversal of sleep wake cycle, changes in psychomotor activity. The patient can be either agitated or hypoactive. Depending on that, we categorize hypoactive delirium and hyperactive delirium. Um, patients can experience illusions and visual hallucinations. Patients may appear perplexed and there is emotional ability. So, I, now you, uh, I think you can understand how to diagnose uh, delirium, so, but you have to differentiate um, the patient, the diagnosis from other, other causes of similar symptoms, such as dementia, depression, and psychosis. One of the key, key features um, is orientation. And you can also do uh, check sleep uh, cycle disturbances. Um, hallucinations and illusions which are suggestive of acute um, brain insult rather than psychosis and uh, acute onset again points to uh, delirium compared to dementia. In depression of course uh, you have low mood, the fluctuating cause is not that prominent and uh, uh, another feature that I have to tell you is that in delirium, they may experience these psychotic um, symptoms, visual hallucinations and illusions. These are also very disorganized and transient. The patient may not remember what the patient has told you about two hours back. So patient has, in fact, has an amnesia for all the symptoms that they may experience during delirium. But in psychosis, psychotic symptoms, psychosis is actually a, not a good term, say in schizophrenia or delusional disorder or even mania, the psychotic symptoms are relatively constant, right? They may talk about the same delusion today and also tomorrow, but in delirium, that doesn't happen. Patient may not remember what, um, the patient has uh, described today uh, when you ask about the same tomorrow. The patient may talk about say snakes today and then tomorrow the patient may talk about ghosts or something like that. And in psychosis essentially consciousness is not impaired, right? So we already discussed about these things, so delirium and differentiating delirium from dementia is very important. Um, 
This again, we discussed delirium can be hypo or hyper, hypoactive delirium or hyperactive delirium. So this is very important. Again, we described this cognitive research, the concept of cognitive research. It, it, in fact, it literally means the, the amount of functioning um, gray matter or cerebral reserve. Um, and a series of insight. So these two are the key determinants of uh, whether the patient is going to develop delirium or not. If the patient has good cognitive reserve, he's less likely to develop delirium. But if the patient has um, low cognitive reserve, such as dementia, elderly, neurological conditions, and mental retardation, those patients will uh, develop delirium with uh, um, um, less severe medical. So these are the risk factors. Age is a risk factor, especially if the patient has a patient is more than eighty. Extreme physical frailty. Now, if the patient has uh, is physically weak, now we see this commonly um, in cancer wards. So we, you know, when they have end stage. Um, uh, malignancies and also renal wards when they have end stage renal failure, um, they are they become confused. <coughs> Multiple medical problems. Polypharmacy drugs can cause confusion. Oh, sorry, delirium. Um, so um, you have to go through the uh, medication chart. Many medications can cause delirium. Sensory impairment. If the patient has visual or auditory impairment, the patient is uh, at high risk of developing delirium because he or she may misinterpret normal sensory stimuli more. And there's an association. There's a lot of research on this. Neurological conditions. If the patient has long term epilepsy, strokes, and dementia. And previous history of delirium, if the patient has a history of delirium, that means that the patient's brain is um, sort of uh, vulnerable to develop delirium, okay? So dementia is one of the most consistent risk factors. So when uh, we discuss about how to differentiate dementia and delirium, but commonly what we see is delirious patients um, have underlying dementia. Right, elderly patients. So dementia is, because they, they, their cognitive reserve is anyway low, and even with trivial problems like urinary tract infection, constipation, and you know, uh, they will develop uh, delirium. So, it, so dementia is seen about in about 25 to 50% of these patients, in fact. Right, so what are the causes of delirium? Anybody? Oh, it's there in the side. Any physical or mental illness or any process interfering with normal metabolism or function of the brain, especially physical problem, mental illnesses less commonly, uh, can actually cause delirium. So um, it depends on your cognitive reserve. Sometimes trivial problems like constipation, even skin sepsis. I have seen a patient uh, who has become delirious, an elderly gentleman, because of uh, an infected um, skin rash um, and um, electrolyte disturbances, um, blood sugar level changes, um, and um, normality of any system. If that is good enough to affect the cognitive reserve of an individual can cause delirium. But you have to be careful if the patient is apparently healthy and relatively young, and if the patient is coming with delirium, you have to, you, you should be worried. It can be due to an intracranial hemorrhage. It can be due to an overdose of a, of a drug or even a poison. It can be due to um, drug withdrawal, many, 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 uh, many uh, substance withdrawal, uh, uh, such as alcohol, 
can cause delay. Now, this particular patient, now the patient was, was admitted four days back and developed a uh, On admission, the patient uh, would have taken alcohol on the same day. So there's not enough time for him to develop delirium. So usually delirium um, arises during second and third day after stopping alcohol. So that is the, uh, one of the differential diagnoses. So true, the patient here has right leg cellulitis, septic, but you have to always think about possible delirium, uh, sorry, possible alcohol withdrawal state. So alcohol withdrawal is one of the causes for delirium. And um, so any, any, any medicine, if uh, the exam, if they ask about, write down causes of delirium, you have to prioritize, right? You should not talk about constipation, constipation at the beginning. You know how to write answers, you know. Right, but what happens? Many are uh, and stuff like that, and activation of certain um, enzyme cascades. If you can remember in your biochemistry, you would have learned this. And, uh, so, uh, yeah, so. What happens is then there is uh, a disturbance uh, to the neuronal cell and so the membrane actually there's a disruption to the activity of the membrane and um, calci calcium is a major um, uh, um, sort of in the final common pathway calcium plays a major role. There's an influx of calcium which will actually uh, lead to um, uh, activation of this enzyme cascade required to maintain our cognitive functions. And um, so anything that can disrupt the neuronal uh, membrane, neuronal cell, uh, can actually cause delirium. These are the causes. Now there can be many. I mean, you, if in in, an, in the exam, think about the systems, and then try to understand uh, if it's. Uh, I think it's a stupid question to ask. But, uh, there are many causes. Almost anything can cause delirium, right? And of course, try to understand there are certain things that we have to be for it now. Urinary tract infections and pneumonia commonly associated, alcohol and opiate withdrawal, acute metabolic um, conditions such as acidosis, renal failure, and hyponatremia. Remember this, especially in elderly. Trauma, severe pain. In a dementing patient, his. Uh, is induced delirium. So pain management is very important in elderly because of this. CNS pattern really worried because there can be, uh, you know, this can be a sign of internal bleeding, right? Uh, hypoxia or hypovolemia can cause delirium. Deficiencies, certain vitamin deficiencies, endocrine problems, acute vascular problems, uh, and then um, toxins, drugs, um, and um, heavy metals. 
we already discussed this identify trait underlying cause complete lab test investigate a cause with trouble assume an underlying organic cause and try to correct that ensure adequate hydration nutrition oh, these are important use clear straightforward communication you have to actually clearly explain to the patient uh, so frequent orientation or reorientation of the patient is necessary so this is the management of psych psychiatric part or behavioral part so apart from treating the underlying cause you have to communicate with the patient frequent reorientation frequent reassurance is very important treat in an adequately lit room so the patient should be cared in a room where there is adequate light and um uh, that's why in icus there is you know this light management is very important in icus because the patients uh, that uh, that will help patients to not to be disoriented this will uh, help the patient and so compared to other conditions we should in fact ask the patients relatives to come and talk to the patient frequently right So they may require additional nursing input. Actually, recommendation is one-to-one -one care, but in our country it's difficult. But uh, they need a lot of nursing input. Uh, so in the management, so you have to treat the underlying cause, but to control the behavioral part, control the psychiatric element, we should not use medications as the first line. So you have to use all the other measures that we have discussed, but not the medication. But sometimes we have to use medication if the patient is very agitated. Um, so medications can cause problems in a delirious patient because their brain is already affected. If we give more medications, that can actually harm the patient, right? But um, we'll, I'll explain. So. Uh, what are the medications we can as Victor Stradine for few days. The main, the main medication that we use is haloperidol. It's the drug of choice if we need a medication because it has both oral and intramuscular uh, parenteral preparation. So we can easily sort of um, uh, tailor the dose according to the patient's requirement. And the evidence says that haloperidol is um, the most effective to control delirium. Of course, there are problems. It can cause cardiac issues, cardiac arrhythmias, and um, extracurricular side effects and stuff like that. So you have to be very careful. Um, so antipsychotics should be avoided in Parkinson's disease because it can worsen the situation. But if the patient doesn't have Parkinson's, you can use haloperidol, small dose, very small dose compared to what we use to control manic patients or severely psychotic patients. We use a very small dose, but you have to monitor cardiac, uh, monitor for cardiac arrhythmias. Avoid, should be avoided in patients with hypotension, tachycardia, arrhythmias, and extrapyramidal symptoms. And, um, if the patient has dementia, we are reluctant to use haloperidol just to increase risk of cerebrovascular accidents.
in the broader sort of half life, but not a long term medication. We have to um, sort of uh, um, uh, use it as short term. But sometimes benzodiazepines per se can cause agitation. So we have to be careful. There's the thing called paradoxical agitation. So benzodiazepines can cause agitation. And it also can cause, especially in elderly. So in elderly patients, we have to be very careful when we use benzodiazepines. So it can worsen the problem. A patient may fall and have a hip fracture. Dementia with levy bodies. So th this is, um, so um, they're extremely sensitive to antipsychotics. This, this is related to Parkinson's actually. So they may develop extra pyramidal side defects from antipsychotics. So we have to minimize using uh, this in levy body. Levy body dementia, I'm not going to talk about it. You can read about it. It's a cause of dementia and it's related to um, Parkinson's it has both features of dementia and Parkinson's disease. So they have, they usually have uh, Parkinson's uh, features like this, tremors, bradykinesia, and they have tendency to fall. They have frequent falls. Um, so we have to educate the family. And sometimes patients may, usually it's a very transient thing, acute, onset and recover patient would recover quickly but in elderly patients sometimes it may take six to eight weeks for a complete recovery right any questions so far i just went through the theory because it will help you to understand this concept this uh, condition better any questions Can you all hear me? Very silent patch. Can you all hear me? Yes, sir, we can hear. Right. Okay, good. Did you understand what I explained? Was it clear? So it's actually a challenge to do discussions um, online difficult to, you know, keep our focus. Do you need a break? But we are going to finish soon there anyway. Okay, so shall we do these MCQs? Um, yeah, very straightforward, right? Um, so true or false about delirium carries a high mortality. Is it true? True or false? Sorry? Delirium carries high motor. Yes, it's true, right? So that's why it's an emergency. It should be treated at a mental health unit. What do you think? False. False. Yes, it's false. Should be treated at a medical unit, actually, at least at a high dependency unit because it's an emergency. And usually the medical problem is the emergency, right? It's an irreversible condition. What do you think? False. Yes, it's false. It's a reversible condition. It's essentially reversible. Unless the patient has dementia, still it's reversible, but if the patient has dementia, you may not see the complete recovery because there is always background cognitive decline, but the delirium part should improve. Benzexol is an effective treatment. So, okay, this is a distinction uh, uh, question. What do you think? False. Why is it false? Can I agree? Yes, very good, very good. Yeah, so Benzexol is an anticholinergic medication. I, I explained that acetylcholine is, is, an, is a very important neurotransmitter which will help us to maintain our cognition. So when there is a Benzexol is an anticholinergic, so we are going to worsen. The, so that's why it's very important to go through the drug chart. 
So psychiatric patients actually, they commonly develop delirium. So one of the things you have to do is go through the chart and see whether we are, we have, we have been giving more anticholinergics. The feature of delirium, is it true or false? Uh -huh. Sorry? False. What, what do others think? It's true, sir. Yeah, it's true, isn't it? So there, are, I, I told you, commonly delirium is uh, um, associated with the increased motor activity or agitation, but sometimes, really, it can be associated with reduced motor activity. Then it is called hypoactive delirium. It's a difficult condition to diagnose because the patient may lie still, so nobody's worried about the patient because he's okay, behavior-wise. In agitation, everybody's worried. The patient is agitated, the aggressive, but they don't know what the patient is going to do next. So, um, so uh, uh, but you have to be very careful. You have to try and uh, uh, diagnose delirium, uh, even if the patient has hypoactive states. Good. Um, Psychomotor agitation. Visual hallucination. Now, the, now you, your answer is um, somewhat correct. When there is, the, if a patient complains of visual hallucinations, that is a very important symptom we have to look into. But according to this MCQ, what is Yeah, disorientation is the correct answer. The, which is the most important in determining whether a patient has delirium. So visual hallucinations can happen in other conditions such as intracranial tumors um, without delirium, all right? So although it's an important symptom that we should pay attention to because it can indicate a more problematic diagnosis it is not very i mean it's not but we say this uh, of delirium so visual hallucination is not a not a pathognomonic feature but disorientation yes so disorientation is the most important okay true and uh, false a feature of delirium that can help differentiate it from dementia so this is a true false um, MCQ. Memory loss, true false, true or false. Can can we use memory loss to di differentiate dementia from delirium? What do you think? Probably not, sir. Yeah. Oh, okay. okay. Good. Okay. Yeah, your guess is correct. Memory is a cognitive domain. So, but in both dementia and delirium, there's global impairment of all cognitive domains. So, difference is in delirium, there's impairment of consciousness, and in dementia, there's no. So memory loss can be a feature of both. So we cannot use that to differentiate both, right? Disorientation, yes. What about fluctu fluctuating course? True. 
Yes, it's true. In dementia, it's usually insidious, progressive condition. In delirium, the patient may be well at a given point of time, but then the patient will become very agitated and confused in about two hours' time, and then the patient will again improve. So, become very delirious, but during daytime, patient may appear quite normal. So, fluctuation. Fluctuating course is one of the features. Disorganized thinking. False. Yes, false. So disorganized thinking is manifest through speech. Again, it's a cognitive um, uh, domain. So in, in delirium, What do you think? False. Yeah, false. Both these conditions, agitation can be seen. In dementia also, agitation can be seen. They also have a lot of psychotic symptoms sometimes due to dementia. Due to memory problems, they can get agitated. One of the commonest um, symptoms is they may forget where they have put their money and valuables. So they may accuse others of stealing. Paranoid that. Okay. So they don't, they are not fully aware that they have memory problem, but they know that their belongings are, so they misplace their belongings. So they interpret that in a very negative way and would accuse others of stealing and can become agitated. Okay, so agitation is seen in both delirium and dementia. In delirium, again, due to misinterpretation of sensory stimuli, misinterpretation of faces and people, they can become agitated and um, even without that, they can become agitated. Following are predisposing factors for development of delirium. Age greater than 80, true or false? True. Yes, true. Female gender. What do you think? Do you think that females are more? False. False. But if this is depression, yes. Depression and anxiety disorders, many anxiety disorders are common among females, but delirium, no, it's not a determining factor. Prior history of delirium, what do you think? True? Yeah, true. Neurological disorders? True. Yes, true. Especially the neuro, if the neurological condition. Strokes and uh, What is the pharmacological therapy preferred? First of factors. One is uh, you can easily uh, convert to parenteral if necessary, and you can calculate the total dose. And also, it's a piece of, it's available in um, medical wards. But sometimes we give cotyphin. Uh, if the patient has tendency to develop extrapyramidal side effects, because cotypin doesn't have that much of uh, extrapyramidal side effects, but 
fuel level. Remember, haloperidol is preferred medication. True or false about management of delirium? Keeping the patient in a dark room. What do you think? False. Um, patients should um, be able to interpret sensory stimuli accurately. So they need some kind of, um, you know, light, some amount of light, but overstimulation again should be avoided. So this should not be a bright. Um, aware of surroundings, but should not be um, should be dark enough to reduce population, right? So remember this. So I, in ICUs, um, in our ICUs also they use this. Uh, they actually um, even in the night they keep a small light, so that is important. Frequent reorientation. True, sir. True, yes, it's true. Because then the patient's agitation will be less. So they are not they are not sure what is happening around them. So frequent reorientation will sort of momentarily orient them to the current current uh, uh, environment. That will help them to correctly understand what is happening around. For example, if um, if they are not sure where they are, if we tell them you are in the hospital and I am a doctor, I am helping you, the patient may be a little comfortable. So the patient will start thinking, okay, uh, okay, I am in the hospital. Right? So frequent reorientation is very important. Hydration. True, sir. Yes, hydration is very important. Sometimes they may forget to have enough to, even at the the earlier stages of delirium, they can become dehydrated. That can actually worsen the, the symptoms of delirium. So you have to hydrate the patient. Um, IV upper oral haloperidol as first line management. Is this true or false? Good, very good. So I now in the previous MCQ, the stem means if the medication, if a medication is required, what is the best choice? Or even they may say, if a medication is required, what is the first line of medication? Then the haloperidol, the answer is true. But in this case, management of delirium, as I told you earlier, we are not try not to use antipsychotics or any psychotropics. So it's the main stay of management is managing the underlying medical problem and behavioral uh, interventions that we have discussed, a change in the environment and you know stuff like that. But if medications are really necessary, haloperidol is the choice. So remember this, okay? Frequent family visits. True, sir. Yes. Good. Okay. This is probably the last one. True or false about causes of delirium? UTI. True. Subarachnoid hemorrhage. Causes of delirium. Subarachnoid hemorrhage. What do you think? Yeah, it's easy. Yes, good. When constipation can cause delirium, uh, especially in an elderly person, dementing patient, um, that you have to, of course, ex exclude all other causes. If the patient is constipated, even after, if, if, even after exclude, if the patient is delirious, even after excluding all the other causes, you have to look for trivial problems like constipation, pain, and skin rash. I, I 
tell you the screen ratio is fine. So it depends on the cognitive reserve of the patient. If the patient is severely demented, even trivial issues like skin sepsis or pain, constipation can cause delirium. Okay. All right, that's it. Any questions? Hope you all in, um, understood this. Sir? Yes. Uh, there was a question regarding uh, delirium and dementia. Yeah. Uh, in which uh, fluctuating course was. Everybody, but philosophically, we cannot say that um, it's a feature of dementia. Um, but now the stem says fluctuation of consciousness or fluctuation of symptoms or confusion can be used to differentiate can be used if they say if, now that stem would give you a hint you can select the answer as true but the stem says this now I, is always um, suggestive of delirium then it's a, it's maybe you have to think of now you won't get that kind of MCQs because it's very unfair because nothing in this medical field is discreet, right? We have uh, uh, used these classifications actually for us to easily communicate. So you will find this gray area. So you will not be getting those kind of very philosophical questions, but if the stem cells can be, then it's easy, isn't it? But the person who asked that question, I'm really happy. Lingan is aware of this. So read more. Psychiatry is a fascinating field. So you cannot sort of, whether there's categorical classification, there's a lot of overlap. That's why we need Psychiatrists. That's why we need doctors. If everything is categorical, we don't need doctors, right? It's just a matter of entering symptoms and coming to a categorical diagnosis and treat accordingly. But it's not as simple as that. Okay. Any other questions? I think I answered the question. Did I? Uh, yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Yes. Any other question? Yes, again, a good question. Yeah, in, uh, initially, you have to actually uh, tailor the dose according to the response, right? Very small dose. Now, in Sri Lanka, now in this slide, they have mentioned 0.5 milligram, but in Sri Lanka, we have 1.5 milligram tablets. So, in our practice, we usually start with 0.75. And we give a small dose and see whether the patient is responding. If the patient is not responding, if, they, if we or she is severely agitated, even after attending to the underlying medical problem, we can give another dose in about four hours or six hours time if the patient is severely agitated. So we may increase the dose according to the response or keep the dose as it is. So on the first day, we try to sort of stabilize the patient on a um, on a dose, and then we use a fixed dose regime for a couple of days, say two, three days. And if the patient has recovered from delirium, we tail off haloperidol. But sometimes, as I mentioned in the slides, some patients will take some time to recover. 
they may need a longer duration of haloperidol uh, on haloperidol because haloperidol can cause cardiac arrhythmias, especially in vulnerable individuals, can cause extrapyramidal side effects. So there are no hard and fast rules how long we should continue. It depends. Hello, hello, Peridol. If you're Any other questions? No. Okay. Good. So read about delirium. You may get a question in the exam. Um, this is a very important area. Um, and try to understand because it's not very difficult, isn't it? It's the base, you know, very simple sort of. Uh, you don't have to memorize a lot of things. Uh, Have to work condition sometimes right but if you are if, if you go through patients you will be able to detect delirium very very commonly now I mean one of the sites I have mentioned that 20 to 30 percent of patients admitted to medical and surgical boards will have delirium so it's a, it's a um, one four to one third of the patients will have delirious symptoms, isn't it? But I mean, all of them may not need special intervention for delirium, but you have to be careful, you have to be vigilant because delirium indicates that the patient is, has a problem issue. All right, so thank you very much for listening. Um, and I hope you enjoyed this. Um, I would have really liked if I was able to do this uh, discussion face to face so that I can see your faces and uh, maintain more maintain a more humane interaction. Um, but um, um, due to COVID situation, this is what we have to do. All right. Um, so hopefully we will meet again and wish you all the best for your studies. Study well. You know, develop your skill of lateral thinking. That is very important to be a doctor. And also improve your social skills. Don't be frightened. Ask questions. And um, don't think what others would think about you. You know, asking questions and, you know, participating in these kind of activities is always a good thing. Even though you made a silly mistake. Right? So those are the skills that you should develop as um, doctors, not only the academic um, you know, knowledge and academic um, achievements, but also you have to have a strong personality to prosper. All right, so thank you very much again. And again, I will, uh, I would like to thank um, PEMSA for organizing this and especially Dominde Asran, my friend, and also Sayuri Pereira, who's also a very good friend of mine. And um, uh, I hope you enjoyed this. Um, if you really have, you know, a serious question, you can um, um, direct the question to um, Dr. Dumidi Asaran or Dr. Sairu Pereira. They will direct that to me and I will try to answer that. All right. Thank you. Good night and have a pleasant evening. Thank you very much, sir.